My name's Joe. I'm an alcoholic. You know, like I was saying, if, if I seem a little sentimental tonight or reminiscent, because uh, I kind of have mixed feelings. I feel a little sad and I feel very full for several reasons. In three days, it'll be my fifth birthday. This is the last night of these tapes. We're, we're going to finish up on the, on the 12th step tonight. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a good feeling. But I'm an alcoholic, and I always, I always hate to see things come to an end. Um, I, usually, I usually use things until they absolutely quit working. Uh, and they're a little easier to let go. When things are still good and you have to give something up, which, which I've had to do sober, uh, it's a little harder. So we're going we're gonna to take a little more time tonight. If, if anybody wants to or has to, has to leave it, at seven, uh, that's okay, because there's there's a few things I'd like to talk about. Um, I'd like to talk about the 12 step. I'd like to talk about <clears throat> my experience and the benefits that I've gotten from service and the traditions and the the concepts a little bit, uh, which are relatively new to me. There's there's a, you know there's there's as much in the traditions as, as we've covered in this book. And, and what we've covered in this book is only scratch the surface. It could go on and on. And I hope for a, a lot of you people it will. Um, then there's as much in the traditions. And uh, I've just begun to experience those because I got into service. Uh, and then there's as much in the concepts. You know, and I think it's kind of interesting that we started these tapes on the title page with the circle and the triangle, and um, several months later, we're all the way back around to the circle and the triangle, where we started uh, to experience the next part. Um, when I hung out in the fellowship, I didn't feel like I belonged. When I got involved in the fellowship, I felt like a member. When I studied and read the steps, I didn't understand. When I experienced the steps, I felt more like a participant in Alcoholics Anonymous. And some major things happened in my life, and I, I had my own spiritual awakening, and I've had, you know, I mean, they're, they're on a daily basis. Even if it's just the realization some days that I'm still sober. But I think it, you know, the 12th step takes me to the next place. You know, you, you don't get to rest very often in this program. You're either moving in one direction or the other, and it's kind of like the 12th step took me to the next part of the program because I needed to experience all three parts. And then I think that circle comes into play because all of a sudden I feel a little, a little more whole than I did when I was new. A lot more whole than I did when I was new uh, because I got involved in service, which is the next part of the program. If I could warn anybody that's interested in this big book at all about anything that was probably my greatest lesson would be not to get so carried away with dotting the I's and crossing the T's and every word in this book. Uh, you can get lost in the dogma and believe me I had my period and probably still do uh, of being a little dogmatic and sometimes a little intellectual. Um, but it's really about the spirit of these steps. Uh, it's really about what happens inside when you do this work. So I guess my warning would be if, if you get involved in this big book, if you uh, start a workshop that we're going to talk about here in a little while, uh, if you work these steps, uh, don't think that sitting in a big book group studying and underlining your book talking about each word is going to do much good for you. Uh, it's about doing what's in this book that, that will change your life. <clears throat> Chapter 7, Working with Others. And, you know, I think the first word, you know, not to mention getting caught up in words, but the first word in this, in this chapter is very, very important to me because I remember before I ever read this book saying to my sponsor, this thing better be real and it better be practical. And I had done a lot of weird, crazy drugs and, and, and had some strange experiences coming off of alcohol. And um, I'd had spiritual experiences and I'd seen weird things. 
and I wanted whatever this was going to do, this spiritual experience that you were talking about, that I was supposed to have as a result of these steps, I wanted it to be real. The kind of spiritual experiences I had didn't do much good the next day or the next week. I couldn't draw from them. I also wanted this thing to be practical. To me, that means what can I do with it after I walk out of this place? What can I do with it after I walk out of these rooms? You know, does it work in my life? You know, and I think that's the test we get to see in the 11th step we were talking about last week. But it says here that practical experience shows that nothing will so much ensure immunity from drinking as intensive work with other alcoholics. It works when other activities fail. This is our 12th suggestion. Carry this message to other alcoholics. You can help when no one else can. You can secure their confidence when others fail. Remember, they are very ill. And, I, you know, I think the reason that magic happens is that he relates to my, my garbage. And he understands me because that's what happened for me. It was finally one person sitting across the table from me who had been where I had been and felt the way I had felt and didn't have to do that anymore. It was kind of like I saw his garbage, but it didn't stink anymore. I knew that he had been changed. Somehow the stink was off his garbage, and it was a great jewel to give. It was a gift. And if somebody would have said to me five years ago that my experience for 17 years or my, my entire experience could one day benefit somebody, you know, I would have thought you were crazy. I never thought my, I thought my experience was not only going to hold me back if I could ever possibly do anything, and I didn't have much hope for that, but I didn't see how it could ever help anybody because I had tried to do that. You know, I didn't go to college and get a degree and try to work in the field just to find out what was wrong with me. That was my main motive, but I was also hoping that maybe someday I could help somebody, and it never happened. It never happened while my garbage was still stinking. But I guess when the miracle of this program happened, and all of a sudden I saw that that was a gift. And it's an absolute miracle that I've been able to help anybody. Show up here sober, uh, have five years, uh, do this. Um, I don't take any of that for granted, and I don't take the credit for any of that. I cannot do this on my own. I was never able to stay sober 30 days for 17 years. I couldn't talk to people when I got here. The first time my mother heard me speaking to me, she said, I've never heard you talk like that, or that long. My own mother. That's real scary sometimes because I know I haven't pulled this off much more than maybe the first few days or weeks. You know, I haven't, I haven't made it go any further than that. I've shown up and I've been willing and I've done the work. I didn't even have the power to do most of this work. It also dawns on me on a regular basis that you people haven't done that for me either. You've been there when I've needed you. You've been there when I haven't needed. You've been there when I've liked you. And you've been there when I haven't liked you. But I know that you haven't moved my life on the way it's gone. You've inspired me. You've given me hope. You've encouraged me. You've called me on my stuff. You've loved me. But I know it's something more than what than human power. You know, and that scares me a little bit because what if that stops? Or what if I turn away from that? What if I get so arrogant that I don't need this program anymore? Because I need the fellowship just as much as I need recovery, as much as I need service. But I'm glad I need all three. Probably the, one of the most humbling things that somebody I sponsored once said was, I'm glad to have a sponsor who's sick enough to need the whole program. Um, and I do. And I've often thought, what, what that Don shared with me could I stop doing? Because he got me right into it right away. Going to lots of meetings, doing this work, being involved in service. Now, what can I leave out? You know, when I get a little complacent, when I get a little tired. And I don't know. I don't know. I know it's all part of a whole. Great promises here on this page. Life will take on new meaning. To watch other people recover, to see them help others, to watch loneliness vanish, to see a fellowship about you, to have a host of friends. This is an experience you must not miss. We know you will not want to miss it. Frequent contact with newcomers and with each other is the bright spot of our lives. 
And if somebody would have said that to me when I was new, that one of the bright spots of my life would be sitting in my living room doing this work with another drunk. You know, that wasn't me. My motives were not like, my motives were to get what I could get at any cost. And I wasn't interested in other people. But I have to say, I have to tell you tonight that one of the most exciting, fun, rewarding things that I do is to sit in my living room with drunks and do this work. I look forward to that. And that's not me. My motives have changed, and I don't know how that happened. There are um, a lot of directions in this chapter for working with, with others. And I guess you could be as dogmatic or pragmatic and a letter of the law a as you want. You know, never do this, never do that. My God, I learned how to 12-step from guys that used to take booze in the car with them to, you know, to the other extreme where people think they've made a 12-step call when they talk to somebody on the phone or take them to a detox and drop them off. In my opinion, that's not a 12-step call. You know, do you go back? Are you there the day they get out? You know, are you willing to sit up with somebody all night? You know, are you willing to sit down and go through this work with somebody, which which takes more of a commitment than I have on my own power. I have to pray every time I meet with somebody to go through these steps. There's days I don't want to. And all of a sudden I watch that change and I, and I get excited about what's going on there. I think probably the most important thing I've learned about working with others or, or a 12-step call is prayer. No two have ever been the same. I mean, when I'm working with somebody that asks me to be their sponsor, the only thing I really know is to go through this book and to do what this book says. But there's, there's exceptions. You get somebody that can't read. You get somebody that can't write. You get somebody that for five or six months they can't just pick up this book and start reading it. I've had that. You know? You pray. You pray before a 12-step call. And it's about God anyway. Probably the most important thing that I've ever learned that I heard a guy from Minnesota say about a 12-step call is that if a man's not ready there's not much you can say that's right and if a man is ready there's not much you can say that's wrong I was also told the only the only bad 12-step call is if I get drunk I see some fine lines there I don't see that as black and white anymore either a lot of people think this is a selfish program I, I'm not so sure the program is selfish. I think it's a very selfless program for very selfish people because selfishness is the root of my trouble. Now, I also understand my sobriety better come first, but I also know that I can't make it. I can't make my sobriety first and pull that off. That sounds like I'm the one that's doing it. I better put my commitment to my relationship with God first, but that was an unearned gift. You know, so there's a lot of fine lines here. And I think if any part of this program taught me that it's not all black and white, it's the 12 step. And it's probably the part of the program that got me out of being so dogmatic and letter of the law and it, you only do it this way, you never do it that way, I was practicing the, the 12 step and, and, and getting involved in service and going out there in my life to practice these principles. You know. I think I used to be a little screwed up about the 12th step and I thought that carrying this message was practicing these principles. And I think what I learned that practicing these principles is carrying the message. <laughs> There's a man in Denver that I love very much that talks about, you know, the way you live makes so much noise there's not really much you can say. I think probably some of our best 12th step work is when we don't know we're being noticed just going on with our life and somebody at work or somebody here or somebody there says something. I've been watching you. I've been watching you and I wonder, you know, what is it you do? I think being open to the 12 steps through the first 11 and especially the work in the first nine and, and being there for step 11 opens us up to all kinds of incredible experiences. There's a little girl in, in um, and I don't know why I'm saying this, but there's a little girl in, in New York City who called me a couple months ago. And she said that she was in a meeting in Dallas, Texas, and that um, she was dying, 10 years sober. I'd lost God. She shared this with the group. 
And the group told her to accept that and just to keep coming back. She said when they said that, she felt really empty. And that this guy came up to her afterwards with this strange look in his eye. And he said that those people that told her that were full of shit. Because she didn't have to accept it because she was dying of untreated alcoholism. And, he, and she said he started ranting and raving like no one else she had ever heard in 10 years. And she heard something. And he, he, he suggested that, that she give me a call and see if I knew about anything in New York. And uh, I told her about a group that, that's into this over in Brooklyn. And all sorts of incredible things started happening for her. My sponsor was there, not the next week or the next month, because he goes there every couple. He was there the next day. She got a chance to go through these first three steps and start an inventory. And turns out there's a lady there in Denver that's done this work that she was like right in contact with. A couple weeks later, she calls me up, and this little girl's on fire, and she said, all I did was say a simple prayer. And it just all opened right up to me. I mean, you never know. You never know what it is, how it's going to happen. So there's a lot of a lot of directions here. Um, when you just on page 90, it talks about when you discover a prospect for Alcoholics Anonymous, find out all you can about him. If he does not want to stop drinking, don't waste any time trying to persuade him. He may spoil a later opportunity. This is this advice is given for his family also. They should be patient realizing that they are dealing with a sick person. At the same time, you know, we see some real miracles happen with, with people that we stick in there with. And let them know that we'll be there when they're, re when they're ready. Um, and keep going back and keep going back. You know, I'm glad they didn't give up with me after my ninth treatment center. And that in my tenth one, there was somebody there. I think the neat thing is, though, he told me he was there to save his ass, not mine. It always seemed like when there was these do-gooders and they're up here and I'm down here and they're at all these places I went, it was like I couldn't, they were so high up there I couldn't see what they were saying. But when a guy was honest enough to say and look right across, even with me at a table, that he was just like me and that he wasn't there to save me, he was there to save him so he could stay sober and he told me about his drinking and what he was like and how he felt, that I somehow heard that. Sometimes it's wise to wait till he goes on a binge. The family may object to this, but unless he is in a dangerous physical condition, it is better to risk it. Don't deal with him when he is very drunk, unless he is ugly and the family needs your help. Wait for the end of a spree, or at least for a lucid interval. <laughs> I didn't have very many of those. Then let his family or a friend ask him if he wants to quit for good. For good. And if he would go to any extreme to do so. If he says yes, then his attention should be drawn to you as a person who has recovered. You should be de described to him as one of a fellowship who as part of their own recovery, as part of their own recovery, try to help others and who will be glad to talk to him if he cares to see you. You know, I think sometimes, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know how Bill and Bob would feel about it, but, you know, I don't think they meant all this stuff about, you know, are you ready to stop drinking for one day? You know, I think we've kind of taken that to an extreme. Because every 12-step every call I see in here, the one that Bill and Bob did earlier on, what they just said here, they talk about, are you ready to quit drinking alcohol for good and all and live life one day at a time? You know, I don't ever want to drink again. And I live life one day at a time. I think it's also part of the, part of the, the damage that the short form of the third tradition has, has caused in AA. The long form says that our, our membership ought to include, include all those who suffer from alcoholism. Yet the short form has been stretched to such a dangerous extreme that it says the only requirement for membership is the desire to stop drinking. 
If he does not want to see you, never force yourself on him. Neither should the family hysterically plead with him to do anything, nor should they tell him much about you. They should wait for the end of his next drinking bout. You might place this book where he can see it in the interval. Here no specific rule can be given. The family must decide these things, but urge them not to be over-anxious, for that might spoil matters. Later on in page 91, it talks about see your man alone if possible. At first, engage in general conversation. After a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him enough about your drinking habits, your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. If he wishes to talk, let him do so. You will thus get a better idea of how you ought to proceed. If he is not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time you quit, but say nothing for the moment of how that was accomplished. If he is in serious mood, dwell on the troubles liquor caused you, being careful not to moralize or lecture. If his mood is light, tell him humorous stories of your escapades. Get him to tell some of his. When he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic Tell him how baffled you were, how you finally learned that you were sick. Give him an account of the struggle you made to stop. Show him the mental twist which leads to the first drink of a spree. We suggest you do this as we have done it in the chapter on alcoholism. If he is an alcoholic, he will understand you at once. He will match your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. I wanted to hear that a man was like me and that he had done those crazy things that I thought I was so alone in doing. You know, I was the only one that felt like that. I was the only one that did that. You know, the day I drank on my dad's funeral when they asked me not to, you know, I, I left that and went back to that hospital feeling like I was the only person that probably ever did that. You know, and I found out here that I wasn't. I think this next statement, although, you know, I'm trying not to be so critical about this, is very important to what's going on in Alcoholics Anonymous now. I don't think we spend enough time doing this in our group with a, with a 12 step call. It says here, if you are satisfied that he is a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. You know, how many people spend time doing that nowadays in AA to help people find out, you know, what are you? What's wrong with you? I mean, if that's the first question we come in here with that's been plaguing us for however many years, what's wrong with me? It only makes sense that that should be the first question that gets answered. And it's amazing the number of people that have been around here for a long time and are still way up in the air about what's wrong with them. Am I this? Am I that? Am I an addict? Am I an alcoholic? Show him how your own experience, how the queer mental condition surrounding the first drink prevents normal functioning of the willpower. Don't at this stage refer to this book unless he has said it and has seen it and wishes to discuss it. He could and be careful not to brand him as an alcoholic. Let him draw his own conclusion. But at the same time, be satisfied that he's a real alcoholic. If he sticks to the idea that he can still control his drinking, tell him that possibly he can, if he's not too alcoholic. But insist that if he is severely afflicted, there may be little chance he can recover by himself. Continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness, a fatal malady. Talk about the condition of body and mind, which accompany it. Keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. Explain that many are doomed who never realize their predicament. Doctors are rightly loath to tell alcoholic patients the whole story unless it will serve some good purpose. But you may talk to him about the hopelessness of alcoholism because you offer a solution. You will soon have your friend admitting he has many, if not all, the traits of, an al of the alcoholic. If his own doctor is willing to tell him he is an alcoholic, so much the better. Even though your protege may not have entirely admitted his condition, 
He has become very curious to know how to get well. How you got well. I'm sorry. Let him ask you the, that question if you will. Tell him exactly what happened to you. Stress the spiritual feature freely. If the man be agnostic or atheist, make it emph emphatic that he does not have to agree with your conception of God. He can choose any conception he likes, provided it makes sense to him. The main thing is he be willing to believe in a power greater than himself and that he live by spiritual principles. When dealing with such a person, you had better use every, everyday language to describe spiritual principles. There is no use arousing any prejudice you have against certain theological terms and conceptions that he may have, about which he may already be confused. Don't ra raise such issues, no matter what your own convictions are. He goes on to talk a little bit more about that and, and sums it up with on, the page, on page 94, we are dealing only with general principles common to most denominations. Then it talks about outlining the program of action. Explain how you made a self-appraisal, how you straightened out your past, and how you are now in endeavoring to be helpful to him. It is important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in your own recovery. Actually, he may be helping you more than you are helping him. Make it plain that he is under no obligation to you and that you hope only that he will try to help other alcoholics when he escapes his own difficulties. Suggest how important it is that he place the welfare of other people ahead of his own. It goes on and gives a lot of circumstances and a lot of things that might happen. Um, the top of 94, it talks about unless your friend wants to talk further about himself, do not wear out your welcome. Give him a chance to think it over. If you do, if you do stay, let him stay steer the conversation in any direction he likes. This is, this is sometimes a mistake. If he has trouble later, he is likely to say you rushed him. You will be most successful with alcoholics if you do not exhibit any passion for crusade or reform. Never talk down to an alcoholic from any moral or spiritual hilltop. Simply lay out the kit of spiritual tools for his inspection. Show him how they worked with you. Offer him friendship and fellowship. Tell him that if he wants to get well, that if he wants to get well. You know, it's a long time before a lot of people hear that nowadays, that you can get well here. And in some groups, it would be travesty to even, heresy to even say that. Tell him if he wants to get well, you will do anything to help. <clears throat> and realize at the same time that you're not going to keep any of them sober. Nor do you have the power to get them drunk. If he is not interested in your solution, if he expects you will act only as a banker for his financial difficulties or a nurse for his sprees, you may have to drop him until he changes his mind. This he may do after he gets, some, gets hurt some more. If he is sincerely interested and wants to see you again, ask him to read this book in the interval. After doing that, he must decide for himself what he wants to go, whether he wants to go on. He should not be pushed or prodded by you, his wife, or his friends. If he is to find God, the desire must come from within. If he thinks he can do the job in any other way or prefers some spiritual approach, encourage him to follow his own conscience. You have no monopoly on God. We merely have an approach that worked with us. But point out that we alcoholics have much in common and that you like you would like in any case to be friendly. Let it go at that. Don't, don't be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another alcoholic and try again. You are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. Isn't it amazing you have to be totally desperate to really get it? I remember sitting in a treatment center one night and they where I had been and I was, I don't know, five or six months out of there in the program. And uh, they brought these two women in. One of them was really beat up, had marks all over her arms, all beat up, said she had lost everything. And the other one was dressed really nice and had a continental outside, still had a house up in the mountains and some stuff. And I talked to both of them for about an hour and I looked at one of them and I said, you know, you're gonna have a much harder time with this program than, than this other girl here. 
and the one I was talking to was the one that still had a lot of stuff. Funny thing is, five years later, the one that was all beat up still sober, and the one that was still had some stuff is out there losing some stuff to get ready. I'm going to go on a little bit and uh, hit on some of the main points because there's so much there's so much here in this chapter to to learn, and it it doesn't really mean much if you just learn it and you don't experience it. And the best way to learn about the 12 step is to is to get out there. I mean, they started taking me on 12 step calls when I was new. Sometimes you make a 12-step call with a newcomer and an old-timer, and the, new, the, the, the wet drunk relates much more to somebody with just a few months because he can see that. You know, 26 years is like, you know, sometimes you hear the man with 30 days, you know, when you're still out there. Page 97 gives me the stone. We've been talking a lot through these tapes about the cement from page 17 and the the foundation in, in the first step and if that first step is strong you don't ever have to fall any further than on top of that foundation no matter how crazy you get I want that foundation to always be strong uh, but I know who mixes the cement and put those stones together and it ain't me and that first stone the, the, the cornerstone at the second step and the keystone page 97 says never avoid these responsibilities but be sure you are doing the right thing if you assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You have to act the Good Samaritan every day if need be. I was told the rest of that paragraph are the 12 step promises and uh, I'm not gonna read those but I think we, we each have to discover those in our own way. Uh, if somebody said I was gonna go through all this work to finally get to a place where I could experience the description on page 97 I don't know <laughs> and to think that today I'm grateful for all those things that have happened there's some great guides along the way I like what they talk about uh, on page 98 the third paragraph says burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone the only condition is that he trusts in God and clean house talks about domestic problems and divorce and strained relationships conditions we put on sobriety bottom of page 99 talks about remind the prospect again that his recovery is not dependent upon people it is dependent upon his relationship with God you know and so often nowadays we hear we hear new people talk to like these people and, and uh, getting them to a meeting is what's going to keep them sober or a sponsor. We've seen men get well whose families have not returned at all. We have seen others slip when the family came back too soon. Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything anything we could have planned and I can't tell you how that statement touches me uh, for working with somebody and using prayer and moving on through this work and for my own life um, if he does not want to see you never force yourself on him neither should the family hysterically plead with him to do anything nor should they tell him much about you. They should wait for the end of his next drinking bout. You might place this book where he can see it in the interval. Here no specific rule can be given. The family must decide these things, but urge them not to be over anxious for that might spoil matters. Later on in page 91, it talks about see your man alone if possible. At first, engage in general conversation. After a while, turn the talk to some phase of drinking. Tell him enough about your drinking habits, your drinking habits, symptoms, and experiences to encourage him to speak of himself. If he wishes to talk, let him do so. He will thus get a better idea of how you ought to proceed. If he is not communicative, give him a sketch of your drinking career up to the time you quit. But say nothing for the moment of how that was accomplished. If he is in serious mood, dwell on the troubles liquor caused you. 
being careful not to moralize or lecture. If his mood is light, tell him humorous stories of your escapades. Get him to tell some of his. When he sees you know all about the drinking game, commence to describe yourself as an alcoholic. Tell him how baffled you were, how you finally learned that you were sick. Give him an account of the struggle you made to stop. Show him the mental twist which leads to the first drink of a spree. We suggest you do this as we have done it in the chapter on alcoholism. If he is an alcoholic, he will understand you at once. He will match your mental inconsistencies with some of his own. I wanted to hear that a man was like me and that he had done those crazy things that I thought I was so alone in doing. You know, I was the only one that felt like that. I was the only one that did that. You know, the day I drank on my dad's funeral when they asked me not to, you know, I, I left that and went back to that hospital feeling like I was the only person that probably ever did that. You know, and I found out here that I wasn't. I think this next statement, although, you know, I'm trying not to be so critical about this, is very important to what's going on in Alcoholics Anonymous now. I don't think we spend enough time doing this in our group with a with a 12-step call. It says here, if you are satisfied that he is a real alcoholic, begin to dwell on the hopeless feature of the malady. You know, how many people spend time doing that nowadays in AA to help people find out you know, what are you? What's wrong with you? I mean, if that's the first question we come in here with that's been plaguing us for however many years, what's wrong with me? It only makes sense that that should be the first question that gets answered. And it's amazing the number of people that have been around here for a long time and are still way up in the air about what's wrong with them. Am I this? Am I that? Am I an addict? Am I an alcoholic? Show him how your own experience, how the queer mental condition surrounding the first drink prevents normal functioning of the willpower. Don't at this stage refer to this book unless he has said it and has seen it and wishes to discuss it. He could and be careful not to brand him as an alcoholic. Let him draw his own conclusions. But at the same time, be satisfied that he's a real alcoholic. If he sticks to the idea that he can still control his drinking, tell him that possibly he can, if he's not too alcoholic, but insist that if he is severely afflicted, there may be little chance he can recover by himself. Continue to speak of alcoholism as an illness, a fatal malady. Talk about the condition of body and mind, which accompany it. Keep his attention focused mainly on your personal experience. Explain that many are doomed who never realize their predicament. Doctors are rightly loath to tell alcoholic patients the whole story unless it will serve some good purpose. But you may talk to him about the hopelessness of alcoholism because you offer a solution. You will soon have your friend admitting he has many, if not all, the traits of, an al of the alcoholic. If his own doctor is willing to tell him he is an alcoholic, so much the better. Even though your protege may not have entirely admitted his condition, he has become very curious to know how to get well. How you got well, I'm sorry. Let him ask you the, that question if you will. Tell him exactly what happened to you. Stress the spiritual feature freely. If the man be agnostic or atheist, make it emph emphatic that he does not have to agree with your conception of God. He can choose any conception he likes, provided it makes sense to him. The main thing is he be willing to believe in a power greater than himself and that he live by spiritual principles. When dealing with such a person, you had better use every, everyday language to describe spiritual principles. There is no use arousing any prejudice you have against certain theological terms and conceptions that he may have about which he may already be confused. Don't ra raise such issues, no matter what your own convictions are. He goes on to talk a little bit more about that and, and sums it up with, 
on the page on page 94 we are dealing only with general principles common to most denominations then it talks about outline the program of action explain how you made a self appraisal how you straightened out your past and how you are now in endeavoring to be helpful to him it is important for him to realize that your attempt to pass this on to him plays a vital part in your own recovery actually he may be helping you more than you are helping him make it plain that he is under no obligation to you and that you hope only that he will try to help other alcoholics when he escapes his own difficulties suggest how important it is that he place the welfare of other people ahead of his own it goes on and gives a lot of circumstances and a lot of things that might happen um, top of 94 it talks about unless your friend wants to talk further about himself do not wear out your welcome give him a chance to think it over if you do if you do stay let him steer the conversation in any direction he likes this is this is sometimes a mistake if he has trouble later he is likely to say you rushed him you will be most successful with alcoholics if you do not exhibit any passion for crusade or reform Never talk down to an alcoholic from any moral or spiritual hilltop. Simply lay out the kit of spiritual tools for, tools for his inspection. Show him how they worked with you. Offer him friendship and fellowship. Tell him that if he wants to get well, that if he wants to get well. You know, it's a long time before a lot of people hear that nowadays, that you can get well here. And in some groups, it would be travesty to even, heresy to even say that. Tell him if he wants to get well, you will do anything to help. <clears throat> and realize at the same time that you're not going to keep any of them sober. Nor do you have the power to get him drunk. If he is not interested in your solution, if he expects you will act only as a banker for his financial difficulties or a nurse for his sprees, you may have to drop him until he changes his mind. This he may do after he gets, some, gets hurt some more. If he is sincerely interested and wants to see you again, ask him to read this book in the interval. After doing that, he must decide for himself what he wants to go, whether he wants to go on. He should not be pushed or prodded by you, his wife, or his friends. If he is to find God, the desire must come from within. If he thinks he can do the job in any other way or prefers some spiritual approach, encourage him to follow his own conscience. You have no monopoly on God. We merely have an approach that worked with us. But point out that we alcoholics have much in common and that you like, you would like in any case to be friendly. Let it go at that. Don't, don't be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another alcoholic and try again. You are sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer isn't it amazing you have to be totally desperate to really get it i remember sitting in a treatment center one night and they where i had been and i was i don't know five or six months out of there in the program and uh, they brought these two women in one of them was really beat up had marks all over her arms all beat up said she had lost everything and the other one was dressed really nice and had a continental outside still had a house up in the mountains and some stuff and I talked to both of them for about an hour and I looked at one of them and I said you know you're going to have a much harder time with this program than, than this other girl here and the one I was talking to was the one that still had a lot of stuff funny thing is five years later the one that was all beat up still sober and the one that was still had some stuff is out there losing some stuff to get ready I'm going to go on a little bit and uh, hit on some of the main points because there's so much there's so much here in this chapter to to learn and it, it doesn't really mean much if you just learn it and you don't experience it and the best way to learn about the 12 step is to is to get out there i mean they started taking me on 12 step calls when i was new um, sometimes you make a 12 step call with a newcomer and an old timer and the new the the, the wet drunk relates much more to somebody with just a few months because he can see that you know 26 years is like you know, sometimes you hear the man with 30 days you know when you're still out there page 97 gives me the stone we've been talking a lot through these tapes about the cement 
from page 17 and the, the foundation in, in the first step. And if that first step is strong, you don't ever have to fall any further than on top of that foundation, no matter how crazy you get. I want that foundation to always be strong. Uh, but I know who mixes the cement and put those stones together, and it ain't me. And that first stone, the, the, the cornerstone at the second step, and the keystone, page 97 says, never avoid these responsibilities, but be sure you are doing the right thing if you assume them. Helping others is the foundation stone of your recovery. A kindly act once in a while isn't enough. You have to act the Good Samaritan every day if need be. I was told the rest of that paragraph are the 12 step promises and uh, I'm not going to read those but I think we, we each have to discover those in our own way. Uh, if somebody said I was going to go through all this work to finally get to a place where I could experience the description on page 97, I don't know. <laughs> and to think that today I'm grateful for all those things that have happened. There's some great guides along the way. I like what they talk about uh, on page 98. The third paragraph says, burn the idea into the consciousness of every man that he can get well regardless of anyone. The only condition is that he trusts in God and clean house talks about domestic problems and divorce and strained relationships, conditions we put on sobriety. Bottom of page 99 talks about remind the prospect again that his recovery is not dependent upon people. It is dependent upon his relationship with God. You know, and so often nowadays we hear we hear new people talk to like these people and, and uh, getting them to a meeting is what's going to keep them sober or a sponsor. We've seen men get well whose families have not returned at all. We have seen others slip when the family came back too soon. Both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. If you persist, remarkable things will happen. When we look back, we realize that the things which came to us when we put ourselves in God's hands were better than anything anything we could have planned and I can't tell you how that statement touches me uh, for working with somebody and using prayer and moving on through this work and for my own life um, if I would have put a list of things that I would have liked to have seen at the end of each year they would have been much less than what's been going on at the end of each year I've been sober I made one of those lists in my, la in my last treatment center five years ago. Uh, what I'd like to see happen in my life. I think my therapist said make a list of what does Joe Hawk need to be happy. <laughs> and I actually thought I knew what I needed to be happy then. <laughs> but I made that list and I, and I didn't look at it until I was a year sober and a lot more. Everything on that list had happened and more and I just started crying. It was unbelievable. I like when they talk on the bottom of page 100 about assuming we are spiritually fit, we can do all sorts of things alcoholics are not supposed to do. You know, and yet I sit around meetings all the time and I hear, oh, you can't do that. Oh, you, you're, you, you work in a bar? Oh, leave the job. You're miserable with your wife? She's still drinking? Leave her. Can't go around that. Can't do that. I mean, I don't hear a lot of freedom sometimes. I mean, if they would have done that now and on all these years, a lot of us would have been screwed. They said they told those women and those men in Al-Anon, you can get free whether he gets sober or not. And we don't, we don't do that that much here. <coughs> oh, you can't miss a meeting for a week because of business. You better, you better forget that. No, no. One of the most rewarding experiences I had in this program when it was me and God for three weeks in Mexico with no AA. And I was only about a year and a half sober. And then later to sit in Montreal at the International at the loners international meeting with 5,000 loners and internationalists who don't have the privilege of meetings to stay sober and hear their stories. I think we can't do any of this or any of that or you can't go there. Uh, this program's about freedom. Doing this work is about getting some freedom in your life. What if a job calls, you're back in your, li in your life, you're back in the mainstream and something really big happens in your job and for three or four weeks you can't be at AA every night. Can you stay sober? Sure you can.
What if what if the wife is drinking or the husband and you're sober? Can you get free to stay in that marriage? Or can you get free to leave? Some of us are in those relationships that I know all too well. You can't stay or leave. You know. And I think sometimes we push we push it off too easily and just give them the easiest route. Oh, leave. You know, I like to tell people, listen, you can get free right where you're at, and when you're free where you're at, maybe you'll be able to move on or maybe you'll be free to stay. You know, we limit ourselves so much in this program. Oh, I can't go do that. Oh, it can't be. I mean, my sponsor. My sponsor wouldn't be there. You know, I wouldn't have anybody to call every day. God forbid, uh, Joe didn't show up at the meeting tonight, and if they don't see me for three days, they probably think I'm drunk. You know? I don't, that's not what I came here for. I came here to go on with my life. And the miracles happened is that I love AA and to go to AA. And I love talking to my sponsor. And I love going to meetings. But I don't need those things today to stay sober. I hope I never get too far away from that and forget where I got this and give back to the program, even tr even to try to give back to the program a, a, a smidgen of what's been given to me will take the rest of my life. We don't hear a lot about the people that go right out through AA. We hear a lot of people that, that go back out drinking. We don't hear a lot about the people that move on and get dis discouraged with AA. A lot of those people never drink. The sad thing is we never see them and they never tell us the freedom you can really have and they forget where they got it. And who knows about those people? That's not what I want to do. But I also don't want to be tied down to the program like dope or a penitentiary or methadone. I mean, the miracles happen is that I now love AA. I don't have to go. I want to, and I love to. It's about getting back out in the mainstream and, and, and back into your family and back into a career and back into business, and back into love and service and, and trying to get some balance. Page 101 talks about we meet these conditions every day. An alcoholic who cannot meet them still has an alcoholic mind. There is something the matter with his spiritual status. His only chance for sobriety would be someplace like the Greenland ice cap, and even there an Eskimo might turn up with a bottle of scotch and ruin everything. In our belief, any scheme of combating alcoholism which proposes to shield the sick man from temptation is doomed to failure. If the alcoholic tries to shield himself, he may succeed for a time, but he usually winds up with a bigger explosion than ever. We have tried these methods. These attempts to do the impossible have always failed. So our rule is to not avoid a place where there is drinking if we have a legitimate reason for being there. That includes bars, nightclubs, dances, receptions, weddings. Next paragraph talks about, you will note that we made an important qualification. Therefore, ask yourself on each occasion, have I any good social, business, or personal reason for going into this place? Or am I expecting to steal a little vicarious pleasure from the atmosphere of such place? If you answer these questions satisfactorily, you need not have apprehension. Go or stay away. There's the freedom. Go or stay. But be sure you are on solid spiritual ground before you start and that your motive is going in going is thoroughly good. Do not think of what you will get out of the occasion. Think of what you can bring to it. If you are shaky, you had better work with another alcoholic like instead. I like the last par next to the last paragraph on 102. Your job now is to be at the place where you may be of maximum helpfulness to others. So never hesitate to go anywhere if you can be helpful. You should not hesitate to visit the most sordid spot on earth on such an errand. Keep on the firing line of life with these motives, and God will keep you unharmed. The last two paragraphs on 103 talk about someday we hope that Alcoholics Anonymous will help the public to better realize, to, to a better realization of the gravity of the alcoholic problem but we shall be of little use if our attitude is one of bitterness or hostility. Drinkers will not stand for it. After all, our problems were of our own making. Bottles were only a symbol. Besides, we have stopped fighting anything 
anybody or anything. We have to. I remember a 12-step call with my roommate and I, and, and I and I guess I experienced the benefit of going with, with another person. Because we went to this guy's house, and about halfway through the 12-step call, he pulled out a shotgun. <laughs> and I was glad that I was with somebody. I remember being sad when people I, I, I uh, pitched or 12-stepped didn't stay sober because I was still taking the credit. And I remember taking the credit when they did and uh, watching my ego do, do that uh, and uh, taking the blame for something I did or didn't do when they got drunk. Uh, you know, I don't have that kind of power. I've seen amazing things happen in 12-step in work. You know? And I can really say as, as crazy as I've gotten, as, uh, as hard as I've tried and nothing else has worked, that getting my ass out of the house down to a detox down to Skid Row, back to the treatment center where I went, and to talk to a new man sure works when everything else is. I also had a feeling one day, and I don't know, I don't know what this is about, but I'll share it with you. Maybe I'm way off because I heard myself saying it in a meeting, and and I guess that's what the meeting was about, and you know, talking about. You know, I was feeling kind of bad today, so I went down to, and it was like, you know, I, I came off this mountain and I went down to Skid Row to the detox, and I was talking to a new man, and boy, I sure sure felt better. And this thought came, you know, when are you going to quit globbing off people's misery to feel better? You know, and that the spirit of tw uh, of the 12th step is that, that maybe I really do want to give someday and that, that I'm really in an okay place. And I got to quit using people's misery to to make up my gratitude list. Um, but sometimes I'm in a place where I really have to remember where I came from. Um, so I guess there's fine lines there all the way through this step for me. I used to see it as real black and white. I've learned a little bit about service. Um, I started out making coffee and cleaning up ashtrays, and I was doing it out of need because I was miserable. I wasn't doing it to give to AA or the group. And then I started doing this work and, and my insides changed and I, and I had some peace in my life and things were, things were changing. And I, and I had a desperate desire to give back to Alcoholics Anonymous because it had saved my life. And I, I wanted to find out what a GSR was and what they did. Got to go to these area assemblies crazy places all over Colorado and meet some great people. I remember the first time I walked into a GSR meeting at an area assembly and it was like I looked around and there was every winner that I respected from every meeting I'd been to in Denver my first year. And I wondered, what are they all doing here? I want some of this. And I got hungry for service. <laughs> so I became a GSR and um, got involved in that. You know, hated by the group because when, when they have to give you a report, ask them for their vote, not being very popular, and going to district meetings. We're out of a district with hundreds of groups. There's five or six people. And you wonder why everybody isn't doing it, and then somebody reminds you that you're not doing it because they are or they aren't. You're doing it to stay sober and save your ass. Uh, that's the one thing that's helped me when I've gotten real critical of when I'm in a service position. Why isn't everyone you know? And, and I'm reminded, you know, you're not doing it for them. You know, you're doing it to stay sober. And I, I got involved at treatment centers. I did a lot of work in the penitentiaries, and that was amazing because when I got sober, I said, I don't ever want to go back to treatment centers, and I don't ever want to go back to the penitentiary. To, I just don't want to go around those places anymore. And I learned a very important thing about service. Don't ever say never because you'll end up doing it. Because most of the service I've been asked to do in, in my short time of sobriety has been in treatment centers and penitentiaries, because that's where I got this, and that's where I've been. When you've been to the penitentiary and 10 treatment centers and you got this message that's kept, it, that's kept you coming back until, until now in a treatment center, I guess that's where you go to carry it. Uh, I think I was two years sober and I got asked to be on the state committee. 
the H&I chairman for Colorado. I can't begin to talk about what an incredible experience that was to see the dedication of the people that do that kind of service. And I was always inspired by my sponsor. He was the state delegate when I met him. I didn't know what that was, but I learned about what that was. He's, he's gone down the scale a little more, and he's a trustee now. After this, he'll probably have to go back to his home group and make coffee. It'll be important again. Uh, and I've learned, he's, he's been my guiding light in, in the fellowship and in, in recovery, his dedication to his service. Uh, and I hope that that's, that's always like that, you know. I felt real sad for a man once in Denver. He said that he looked around the program lately and there was no one that had what he wanted anymore. <coughs> You know, I, I hope there's always those guiding lights in Alcoholics Anonymous for me. And you think, you know, I just don't know how, how Don does that. You know, he goes and goes and goes and gives and gives. And, uh, I saw some dangers in service of getting wrapped up in a title. And I saw some patterns for me that needed to be broken in the last year and a half. Um, I guess it's been a process of surrender and self-will and surrender and self-will. And I had to let go of that title and Moving out here was a big, a big growth step for me to leave that safe little area and having my sponsor right there and my home group right there and uh, working with a lot of people and on the state committee. And to move out here was a big risk and I and I've grown from it. Without having a service title, I love to talk to drunks in treatment. I don't go there as anything because I took all those things I was involved in to extremes had to go back through the work again and see where I was using it wrong. Stop doing some stuff for a while. You know, trying to tell someone about service is trying to tell somebody about what happens when you do the work or like trying to tell somebody what an orgasm is like before they've had one. You could talk and teach and study and learn about what recovery is about, but you haven't done it, you never know. And you can listen and learn and read about what service is about, but until you start doing it, you just really don't know. You know, what it feels like to see a guy across a table dying in a treatment center who was just like you and to see yourself again and, and just to, to say a prayer and start talking and watch some hope come to a dying man. So, I mean, it's just unbelievable to, to, to be a part of that. <clears throat> I feel... Uh, sad sometimes when I hear at different groups that the traditions are to the group what the steps are to the individual. Said, yeah, the groups use the traditions. NAA as a whole uses the traditions. But do you know there's as many in those traditions, Many there's as many principles in those traditions for you as an individual to live your life anytime you're dealing with more than one person as there are in the steps? Then all of a sudden in my selfish, self-centered way, I'm a little more interested in the traditions because before that, when I think they're just for the group and they have a traditions meeting, I'm the first one out of the door. But when I heard that the traditions might have something for me to learn from, to use in my life, when I'm dealing with a, at work or in a family, or anytime I'm dealing with more than one person because I have a little idea that maybe I'm supposed to get out of myself once in a while and deal with more than just me, that those traditions have guiding principles you can use in every area of your life, in a family. Their common welfare comes first. Recovery in that family depends upon unity. For this family's purpose, there's but one ultimate authority, a loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. I mean, I've just started to experience those in my life and see how I can take them out into to any area. Uh, and I would encourage you, encourage, encourage you to do that. See how those traditions and those concepts can be used in your life. And maybe then, someday, you'll care enough about that they go on and work for Alcoholics Anonymous. And maybe one day you'll care enough about, you'll have a thought that if your son comes in here in 10 or 20 or 30 years, that you might like AA to be the way it was when you got here, and that that's what service is really about at those levels. Not changing AA. It's about stewardship, stewardship, from what I've learned. A steward on a ship, 
makes the room the same way each time, and he wants the next passenger to have it just as nice as the passenger before. He doesn't remodel the room every time a passenger leaves. See, I thought service was about going in there to the H&I committee or whatever it was I was doing and make all these renovations and make things better because I got a little better plan than what's going on. And I learned that service is about keeping things the way they are because they're work. And I thought, what if my son came here in 10 or 20 years? Wouldn't I want the message to be here that I, that I was given? Wouldn't I, wouldn't I want uh, AA to be like it was when I got here? You know, I could talk for hours about sponsorship, and I guess it's the same guiding principles as uh, service. You just pray every time you sit down with whoever you're working with. I do seem to have found a way to eliminate a lot of the bullshit uh, as it was done with me. My sponsor let me know that what he did was sit down with people and went through this book. And I knew that if I was to go on with Don, it was going to be serious business and it wasn't going to be about calling him every day and dumping my problems on him and having him work on my life and help me with this or that, that we were going to meet in his living room once or twice a week and we were going to go through these steps because he said he couldn't fix my life and he said he didn't have a lot of answers and he said if I called him with the same problem more than two or three times that he wasn't going to listen to it because I wouldn't believe that there was what the solution was if I wasn't doing that you know and I find that I don't get calls from people who want to just use my name or just call me every day and have me make them feel better because I don't see that as very loving I think the most loving thing to do is to tell people the truth rather than everything is just dandy and wonderful. I used to think that was the most loving thing. And people know because that's all I can do because that's all that was done with me. We sit and we read this book and we go through the steps together. Um, and I seem to get people that want to sit and go through this book and work those steps with somebody. And there have been exceptions and it's not black and white. And there were people that I couldn't open the book for a couple months. Um, and there were guys that couldn't read. And there were guys that couldn't write. So I guess it's about prayer. What's the right thing to do? My experience with my sponsor, I could go on for an hour. I mean, um, he told me the day would come, I wouldn't call him for answers. That I would have done enough of this work to, to find my own answers within. And then I would call him and we would talk about those answers I came up with. He tells a story about a sponsor and uh, the person he's working And I don't buy these words that I hear, pigeon, baby. You know, I don't, if, if, my sponsor never introduced me as a pigeon or a baby in public to someone else. And he never called me that to my face. And he never referred to me as that to anyone else. So I don't, because that's the way I was taught. I have friends that I work with that are no different from me, or are no lower than me, and, and they deserve a little more respect than to be called a pigeon or a baby. Uh, but he tells a story about a sponsor and the guy he's working with walking down a path in the jungle, and they come to a fork, and the, 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 the guy he's working with says, I'm going this way. And the sponsor says, well, I don't know. The last time I went down there, there was a 2,500-pound gorilla, and he, he, he beat the ever-loving shit out of me. And the, the, the guy he's working with says, well, I'm going to go down that way. And the sponsor says, well, I, I'm going to go this way. And the guy he's working with comes back a couple of days later all beat up. And they walk down the path a little further together and they come to another fork. And the guy he's working with says, I'm going to go down this way. And the sponsor says, well, I think we better go this way because last time I went down there, there was a 5,000 pound gorilla. And the guy he's working with decides to go down there and he comes back a couple days later all beat up and they finally walk on the path together. And the moral of the story is if you tell someone there's a 5,000 5, pound gorilla down that path and they go down there and there's only a 10 pound chimpanzee, they're never going to listen to you again. <laughs> now, now I had to think about that for a little while because um, I was very sick and I didn't understand. I remember going to Don with incredible realizations. I just realized this. I just learned this. And he said, well, I've been waiting for you to see that. And I'd say, well, why didn't you tell me? 
you would have saved me a lot of pain and a lot of misery. He said, because I love you more than that. I love you enough to allow you to have your own experience. Of course we share our experience with the people we work with. But we, I don't think we, I think we serve them a great injustice to try to fix them every time they call and put little band-aids on their symptoms because that's all, the, the, that's all it is. We deny them of their own experience in this program and in recovery and in life. And it's the hardest thing to do sometimes when you see somebody going way off track and you want to say, you want to just save them like you think you could or stop them, you know, trying to stop an alcoholic from doing what he's going to do is, we should know that's futile anyway. To go through this process with somebody has been my own personal most rewarding experience because I saw that I finally laid it out for one person, the whole deal. I was always a guy to take bits and pieces here, bits and pieces there. The way I felt after a fifth step, the way I felt when I started making amends and he looked at my, my sponsor looked at me one day and he said, you know, I feel like we're peers now and that we're friends. Or the first time he read a 10th step to me. Um, or the first time he let me drive his RV with his family in the back. I mean, I thought, my God, this guy really actually trusts me. Uh, and from where I come from, th those are absolute miracles. And I think every time I get involved in the 12th step, it takes me all the way back to the first step because I see that I'm powerless and I can't keep him sober and I can't get him drunk and I can't fix him. And then I'm at the second step because I, I better believe that there's a power that can do something here. And I make a decision to let that happen and I say a prayer and we get on with it. There's a word that has been important to me since I took the third step and they reminded me about the chicken and the pig. And we don't hear this word talked about a lot in AA. It's commitment. Commitment. People shriek, shirk, or whatever you call it, tremble. When you hear that word talked about as a topic in a relationship. Willie Lane, you have a telephone call. <clears throat> Commitment. Am I really committed to this program? I have to ask myself that on a regular basis. When I've gotten way off track with service, it's because I didn't remember that it was to save my ass. I thought I was going to be saving some people or changing or making things better. To get into the traditions and 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 the, and to start to learn about the concepts, it just gives me an uh, an added incentive to go on. You know, there's enough there for uh, for a lifetime. To get into the AA service manual, I mean, there's <clears throat> unlimited things to get involved in in this program. Uh, I was asked, and I'd like to talk just a little bit about the um, the step workshops. <clears throat> I think it was um, 1970 or 1975, they had the International in Denver, Colorado, and a man from Canada came down there named Max Jeter and um, talked about a group of men up in Canada who couldn't stay sober, and they all wanted Max to be their his sponsor. And he said he couldn't sponsor them all, but he knew what they could do, and they could pick a time when no one else would come. And they could sit down and they could work the steps together as a group. And they called them the Golden Slippers. And they met every Sunday morning at 7 or 8 in the morning. And people that were serious about recovery came and they sat as a group and worked the steps. And they found these men staying sober. And those, those workshops caught on like wildfire in Denver. And my sponsor tells me they're catching on all over the country. I know there's a, a lot of people in Dallas doing them uh, with 16-week outlines and 28-week outlines, and people getting excited about the big book all over the country. And I'd been in two of those in Denver, and they'd put a sign-up sheet on the club, uh, so-and-so's doing a step workshop, all interested, please sign up, and they get 20 people, and they close it. So they don't call themselves an AA group, and they don't call themselves an AA meeting. So they're not violating the traditions. They call themselves a closed step workshop. And it's usually about 20 or 25 people. Sometimes it's all men. Sometimes it's all women. Sometimes it's co-ed. And though they found people in Denver who could never stay sober getting involved in these workshops and staying sober. And both of my experiences as a participant were incredible. And uh, my home group that I was a member of for four years 
evolved into an idea could we do that same format as a meeting where anybody can any alcoholic can come regardless of where we are and it became a regular closed meeting um, in Denver but we use the same format we go through the book we pause we stop we do everything it says together as a group and that was a, a very rewarding experience to be a member of that group and when I moved out here several people were interested in this that, that knew me and uh, we started one and uh, unfortunately I told them about group conscience and they don't let me run it and I'm not their fearless leader or the guru or the teacher and they call me on my stuff too and we merely sit down 18 of us and we go through that book and we do what it says together as a group and we call ourselves the big book workshop by the sea the Tuesday night big book workshop by the sea and um, there's more than one requirement to be a member so we don't list ourselves and we don't call ourselves an AA meeting or an AA group because there's two requirements you have to have a desire to stop drinking and you have to have a commitment to go through the steps with 18 or 20 other people and show up as much as possible here's the amazing thing we started last December 1986 with 24 people the second week the first week was business and we decided to format secretary and treasurer and a food person and a, we even have a greeter at the door who, who hands out parking permits um, the next week we had 22 the next week we had 20 the fourth week we had 18 and since the end of December we've had 18 people for the last eight months we've had 18 people that's amazing to me the people in Denver that have done a lot more of these than I had said if you start with 20 you'll be lucky to end up with 10 or 12. Uh, we have 18. We've been since the end of December or the middle of December on the first five steps. It's now August 14th and we are all finishing up our fifth steps. It takes a real commitment and it's an incredible experience and the bond that happens between the people in that group is incredible. It's like family. I'd like to read just a little bit of our format to give you an idea of what we do. We have um, a written format, that, and we have a different reader each week. They, you know, good evening and introduce themselves, uh, welcome, uh, serenity prayer, introduce ourselves. We read the forward to the first edition of that first. We have Alcoholics Anonymous for more than 100 men and women who have recovered blah 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 many do not comprehend that the alcoholic is a very sick person and besides we are sure that our way of living has its advantages for all our purpose it is the purpose of the workshop to experience the recovery process as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous either for the first time or again so we may better carry out and understand our primary purpose to stay sober and carry the message to the still suffering alcoholic we do as the big book suggests as a group in a one and a half hour meeting followed by a 15 minute group conscience we have a different reader each week whose responsibility is it is to keep us on track with what is being read the reader would, will pause at each paragraph for comments questions problems or experience with what was just read we are here to talk about recovery only and go through the 12 step process as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous this is not an emotional or an intellectual exercise. This is a spiritual exercise so we can all recover and experience the recovery process as we read it together. Crosstalk is allowed in a loving, supportive manner. Please try to keep your crosstalk experience to your experience only with your questions or comments. We also have a regular Tuesday night beginners workshop at 6.30 for all members of this workshop to discuss questions or problems. pertaining to where they are in the work reader begins reading you pause at the end of each paragraph anything anybody wants to say we get to a question and we use a lot of the statements through the book as questions we consider those questions as a group do we now all believe this do we believe this do we believe this we get to a prayer we do it together as a group we get to a direction we stop and do that as a group and we don't go any further until it's done at 8.50, the reader asks if anyone has anything they'd like to share the last 10 minutes. 
past the basket. At, at 9 o'clock, we have a 15-minute group conscience. We learn about an ongoing group conscience. We learn that last week's group conscience can change. We learn that a group's conscience changes, and it's not written in stone. And then an ongoing informed group conscience is the spirit of a group. And everybody stays for the group conscience. So we get a conscience of that group. I always thought it was funny to have a group of 50 or 100 people and they call a group conscience and you got five or ten people at the group conscience. You're not getting a conscience of that group. You're getting a conscience of the people that stayed after the meeting. And um, to learn about group conscience and watch it happen is absolutely un unbelievable. Somebody makes a motion. We vote. After discussion, pro and con, we vote. And everyone in the room votes for it except one person. So we hear from that one person, the minority opinion, and what he says changes the whole vote back around and you watch absolute miracles in group conscience. We then um, close the meeting with a meditation. A different person does meditation each week from the book and uh, close with the Lord's Prayer. Um, we've broken the book up into sections. Uh, we take each section one at a time. We've broken it into 14 sections. And um, we pause at the end of each section and review what we've covered. You know, that might take an hour and it might take one meeting. Uh, the first section is from the title page to the doctor's opinion, up to the doctor's opinion. We spent two weeks on that. Uh, the second section was from the doctor's opinion up to page 23, step one, the body. We spent four weeks and one more week in review approximately. Section 3, we went from page 23 to page 43, up to the end of chapter 3, to look at step 1, the mind. Section 4 was uh, page 44 to page 57, up to chapter 5, step 2. Section 5 was from page 58 to page 64, up to the instructions for the fourth step. That was step 3. Section 6 was from page 64 to page 67, up to the instructions for the fear inventory. That was step 4, resentment. Section 7 was from page 67 to 68, up to the instructions for the sex inventory. That was step 4, fear. Section 8 went from page 68 to page 71, to the end of chapter 5, and that was the inventory on the sex inventory and the summary about the fourth step. Section 9 will be from page 72 to 76, up to step 6, that will be step 5. Section 10, from page 76, up to the instructions for step 8, that will be step 6 and 7. Section 11 was from page 76 to 84, up to step 10, that will be step 8 and 9. Section 12 will be from 84 to 88 up to the end of into action. That will be step 10 and 11. And section 13 will be page 89 to 103, up to the end of working with others. That's step 12. And then our last section will be from 151 to 164, a vision for you, review what we've done, and decide what we want to do next. For me, the workshop's been an incredible experience. Doing these um, tapes has been an honor and a privilege kept me sober.